Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, and thank you for having me here. It's really, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, present uh, some of the findings that we have uh, from one of the many projects that we have in the Prejai lab running. Now, since I have completely no medical training, I, my idea of what you already know about uh, this subject is uh, very uh, limited. And most of what I think about is coming from less than academic uh, sources. So um, for this reason, and because I'm not a native English speaker, uh, I'd like you to ask you to stop me and ask whenever something is not clear. I've prepared a 45-minute talk with 45 slides. This is already the second. So, uh, <laughs> and so we really have enough time uh, for any questions and to keep everything clear. So what I've planned for today is talk a little bit about StarGuard 3 and a whole lot more about uh, mouse models that have been developed in recent years, uh, partially by us, to, uh, in order to better understand uh, the disease. Now, StarGuard 3, StarGuard's disease, um, is a macular degeneration. And as such, it uh, presents with a central atrophy uh, surrounded most of the time is with a subretinal ring of uh, flex. And as such, it is pretty similar to the much more prevalent age-related macular degeneration. However, it is different from AMD in many aspects. Uh, one very important aspect is the early onset. It starts usually in the late teens, early 20s, so by the time an average AMD patient starts to notice something is wrong, uh, a Stargardt's patient may already be legally blind. Um, another very important difference is that all the known forms of Stargardt, of Stargardt disease um, are related to a single gene defect. Now, the one that I'm going to talk about today, Stargard 3, is that the one that we focused our research on is an autosomal dominant disease, and it is related to a defect in the ELOVL4 gene. Now, what's ELOVL4? The gene codes an enzyme, which is also called ELOVL4, and that stands short for elongates of very long chain fatty acids number four. What this enzyme does is that it takes an already long uh, chain fatty acid, like EPA, uh, and attaches two carbon, a uh, two carbon group uh, to this already long chain, making it even longer, eventually increasing the length above 30 carbon atoms, making very long chain fatty acids. Some of these are polyunsaturated, as you can see in many double bonds, and these are, and if the substrate is polyunsaturated, then the uh, product will be called uh, very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. I'm just going to use the VLC PUFA for short for that. So that's the product of the enzyme. Now, where is the LVL4? Uh, all the species that have been looked at uh, contain the LVL4 in the retina, and inside the retina, it's here in the photoreceptor cell layer. Uh, this is a better picture. Um, this is in the mouse. The green fluorescence shows where, uh, where uh, ELOVL4 can be found. It's in, the, it's in the photoreceptor cell layer. Now, outside the retina, it can be also found in the brain, the skin, the lens, and the testes, but at a much lower uh, level of expression. Now, this expression in the skin will be, become, however, a pretty important later. Question, what is wrong with the LOVL4 in Stargardt 3 patients? All the currently known uh, mutations affect the last exome, the last coding sequence uh, of the gene, the sixth exome, and all of them cause the same uh, effect. The end of the protein is snipped. It's called a truncation, and the truncated part contains a small but very important sequence, which is called the ER retention signal. This ER retention signal makes it possible for proteins to stay inside the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, without this signal, in theory, 
uh, these mutated protein, mutated versions of ELOVR4 cannot stay in the endoplasmic reticulum. Why is that bad? It's bad because lipid synthesis, including, uh, well, all the steps of lipid synthesis happen inside the ER. If the protein cannot stay in there, that is, taking part in this, it will lose its function simply because of that. Now, is that really true? Because this is just having lost the retention signal, it may not affect it really, but experiments have shown that that's actually probably the case. Now, in this experiment, they took GFP tagged ELOVR4 and expressed it in a cell line, it's shown green, and they expressed it together with an endoplasmic reticulum uh, marker that was connected to a red fluorescent protein. And as you can see, the two markers, one for the ELOVR4 and one for the ER, shows perfect localization. Now when they did the same thing with the mutated version, the Sargard 3 causing version of the protein, it formed clumps, and those clumps were not found anymore in the ER. Okay, so it seems that what happens here, that there is a mislocalization of the protein, and there is also aggregation. Both of these are not good for cells. And so this is the basis uh, that is uh, accepted now as what, what is the first problem in Sargat 3 patients. So normally we have ELOVR4 sitting in the, in the membrane of the ER making VLC PUFAs for the photoreceptor cells. Now in a patient, the mutated version of ELOVR4 clumps together with the healthy uh, allele, the healthy version of the protein, and together they leave the ER forming these clumps which are actually called agrosomes. Clump is a very sloppy word for that, sorry about that. Um, so from this comes uh, come two theories of what happens next and what actually kills the photoreceptor cells in the process. So one that I've already mentioned and that is the more prevalent in the literature is that VLC PUFA loss is behind the death of photoreceptor cells. Now this happens because there is a loss of ELOVR4 activity because of its mislocalization and aggregation. And VLC PUFAs, these very long chain fatty acids, are considered, considered very important for maintaining the cell uh, structure, um, the cell membrane structure, whenever the membrane makes uh, sharp turns and falls. And that's what happens, actually, in the outer segments, uh, outer segments of the photoreceptor cells, where you have the discs and where the membrane makes sudden turns. Now, if this is really what's happening, then of course uh, the th a therapy for Sargard 3 would be supplementation of VLC PUFAs. We would just have to put this in the food and give it to patients, and that would be it. Now, the alternative theory that has also appeared in the literature and is somewhat also uh, accepted uh, is that these clumps, called agrosomes, are putting the cells under stress a constant stress because they are trying to clear them away and while they're trying to do so, a so-called unfolded protein response or UPR is initiated. Now UPR is a regulatory mechanism which if you, uh, if you activate it for too long, it will eventually lead to cell death through apoptosis. So if this is the real theory, if this theory tells us what's happening in the forest of those cells, then giving VLC PUFAs to patients will do nothing because the clumps will still be there and the cells will still die. In this case, the only good way to uh, uh, treat these people would be to uh, knock down this bad protein so that it doesn't take out the good and doesn't form these. Yes? Could it not be a little of both? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, our own Paul Bernstein has done a study with supplementation. Yes. And seen a mild but, but significant impact on the disease, so there's no reason why both of them cannot be an issue. 
you're totally right, and this is totally hushed up in the literature. Somebody is, uh, so what I see in the literature is that you are expected to put your weight into either this or this theory, attacking the other, <laughs> and of course that doesn't make too much sense, but because both can happen at the same time. Well, but the relative uh, importance of the, it is also not uh, pretty important to, uh, to know. So many, uh, most research groups have uh, <coughs> tried to tackle this problem of what's, what's, the, uh, uh, what's the mechanism uh, by using uh, models, biological models. Why do we use biological models? Well, first of all, because researchers can't touch patients, <laughs> of course. Um, but mostly because uh, the methods that we use are many times destructive. I cannot, uh, I can ask for a blood sample, but I cannot ask a patient, a stargard patient, to please give me, over, give me one of the retinas, right? I can do that with a mouse. I can take out the retina of a mouse. I cannot do that with a patient. And I can do experiments on, the, on that retina if I want to. I cannot do that with a patient. Uh, and of course, repeat and control is the basics of uh, a good uh, experiment. And we can do that as many times as we want if we work with mice or cells. With patients, that's not really the case. So in order to better understand what's going on at the molecular and cellular level in Stargard free patients, we try to find good biological models that recapitulate the processes, the processes that happen in patients. And using those models, they also give us the possibility, a test bed, for trying whether uh, a possible future th uh, therapy might work or not. So why use mouse models? There can be other, other mice, mouse models. Uh, mice have a couple of adv advantages. <coughs> and one is that they are mammals. And so at the biochemical level, they are recognized pretty similar uh, to humans. Uh, and because they are not humans and they are not even apes, the um, ethical issues are much simpler to tackle. So I mentioned I can take out the retina. Nobody will stop me in that if I have an IOCAC protocol for that. Uh, also, because the ethical issues do not stop us, we can uh, manipulate the genome of the mouse, which is actually already sequenced. So we have the ethical allowance, or it is allowed ethically. We can do it technically. And it's not so expensive that we cannot do it economically. So it's feasible to use mice as models. Uh, and they are used for many diseases. Now, there is one important uh, additional asset in using mice, and that's their short lifespan. And that means that if we have a Stargard 3 model, for example, in our hand, then we don't have to wait 15 to 25 years for the disease to present itself, as in humans, we we'll only need to wait a couple of months until the mouse matures. Of course, on the other side of the same coin is because the, they are short-lived, uh, any process that is a short cumulative process that takes years or dozens of years to happen will never happen in a mouse unless we somehow artificially uh, explode the process to be really unnaturally quick. Uh, and the other major problem with every mouse model that they do not have a macula or any other structure that would resemble a macula. Um, and that's a major issue in, in all the mouse models that are related to AMD and any other macula degeneration. Now, what researchers contend with and say usually at this time is that, well, yeah, no macula, but, but they have cones and they have rods, and the ratio is approximately the same as in humans. So the makeup of the retina is mostly the same if you, do not, if you forget about the macula. And so just remember this, because this is a serious limitation to all uh, mouse models. And people tend to forget about that. And uh, so what we try to achieve, basically, is 
uh, that well, we say that macular degeneration is a cone rod degeneration. So what we want to achieve, basically, is a mouse that shows a progressive cone rod dystrophy that is early onset. Uh, and we do that by manipulating the ELVL4 gene. And that's, that's a, that would be the mouse model. And I think that by the end of my talk, you will find uh, out that uh, we do not have such a model, although I'm going to speak about them. <laughs> so this is just a very simple schematics of what's going on uh, at the level of the ELV4 gene. Because it might get complicated, and I found out that people get mixed up in what is a knock-in, what is a knockout, and what are the different genetic manipulations doing with the ELV4 gene. So in a human patient, we have two copies of ELV4. Uh, and one of them contains the mutations that cause thyroid free. Right? So he's a heterozygote. Uh, in a wild type, wild type mouse, we have also two copies of mouse ELV4 genes. Now, fortunately for us, there is a 93% homology with the human gene, which, is, which means that it is extremely conserved. It's an important protein. And uh, there have been almost no changes. Above 70, 75% homology, we say that they are homologous. So they are the same. So this is very close. Now, the first model that uh, has been tried was, uh, which is the simplest thing, is to just take out ELVL4. And when people took out ELVL4, that was about eight years ago. Uh, and they had, so then they produced a knockout where one of the copy was there, one of the copy was not there, and the result was that nothing happened. The mouse was totally fine. Uh, when they took out both of these, that's a homozygote knockout, the mouse died within an hour after birth, uh, usually within, within five minutes. Now, the reason why this happened was that ELOVR4 is also uh, expressed in the skin, if you remember that little graph. Um, at a lower concentration, but still. And it turns out that in the skin, ELV produces a certain type of lipid called ceramides, which are essential for the water barrier function of the mouse skin. Without that, the mouse skin is per stays permeable to water, and basically, as soon as it comes out of the mother, it suddenly dries out. And there is nothing you can do about that. So this model was not very helpful because the heterozygote didn't tell us anything. Nothing happened. Um, the homozygote died. So um, the next uh, model uh, for Sagar 3 was not in model. In this model, they took a mouse and put the human mutation into the mouse gene. So they basically changed only a short sequence here so that it resembled now what's in the human mutant version. Now, when they made a homozygote, <laughs> so when both of these uh, carried this mutation, it died the same way as a knockout mouse. So that, sh that told us that this little mutation here definitely takes out the function uh, of the protein. Now, what's interesting is that nothing else happened until about eight or nine months of age, which is relatively old in a mouse. Uh, at that time, what uh, researchers have found was a slight increase uh, in the photopic ERG. And this led some people uh, to say that there is a cone degeneration in this mouse model. Now, I think that's totally stupid. If you have a degeneration of the cone system, the photopic ERG goes away. It decreases. Of course, there could be a cone dysfunction which could generate uh, increased ERG, but that's all. So although this model resembles best what's going on in the humans in terms, of, in terms of genetics, because there is just one good copy and one bad copy in it and nothing else, the phenotype uh, is really, really weak. And it's coming up only at the late age, uh, late state, uh, yeah, uh, later age. The best, uh, well, um, 
the mouse model that is considered the best today and has been used by more than one group, uh, more than one groups, was developed here in Utah by Kang Zhang's group. And uh, what they did is that they introduced the bad human gene, the mutated human allele, into the mouse in addition, giving this in addition to the mouse its own complement of ELVL4 genes. And they expressed this at different uh, increasing levels. So this is the expression level of, of, of this transgene compared to the mouse on ELVL4. And by expressing this, they found a degeneration that was early onset. It started already at one month. Uh, because if you look at the number of fluororeceptor cell rows, rows in the ONL, the uh, outer nuclear layer, you see a decrease already at one month. This is four weeks. And then it sharply drops later. So they found a the progressive disease, and they did some ERG measurements as well to back up the findings. So um, that's, that's the currently accepted best model for StarDrive 3 uh, at this point. Now, they used as a control another mouse strain where they uh, put the normal human gene uh, into the mouse. And, and the comparison is usually against this mouse strain. Um, what we decided to do first was to look at how these different mouse mice see, because that's pretty important, uh, and nobody has looked at it actually. And now you can't just ask a mouse to please sit down and read the Snellen chart for you, uh, but you can fortunately uh, use uh, use a mouse. Um, reflex, that's called the optomotor head turning reflex, to assess how well a mouse sees. Now, um, you all know about the optokinetic nystagmus, the reflex. When the, when the visual field moves, we follow it with our eyes. The same thing happens in mice, but in addition, they also move their whole head. And projecting, putting a mouse in uh, a box covered with LCD displays and projecting an image of black and white uh, stripes around it, then moving the whole uh, stripe, uh, stripes around it, the mouse will follow it as long as it can see the stripes. Then what we do is that we increase the spatial frequency uh, of this stimulus until the mouse can no longer tell apart black and from white, it just see grays. And that doesn't move. So if it doesn't move, it will not move its head. So this way we can find the, the visual threshold uh, for a certain spatial frequency. And that spatial frequency tells us what, what the visual acuity of the mouse is. So just to show you how this uh, reflex looks like, there's the mouse, we're looking at it, and the reflex is going up right now. Can you see it's moving its head this way? So I measured the visual acuity in mice uh, and uh, along different age, in different age categories from early teens to uh, old mice and transcend mice. And what I found was basically nothing for the not team, which is shown with, with blue. They have perfectly fine vision for a mouse. Now this is really bad vision for a human. They are legally blind. Uh, I mean, normal mice have like 20 to 1500 vision. That's about this level. And that's normal for, for a mouse. And uh, well, that didn't change uh, in the non So there was no phenotype there. Uh, now, looking at the transgenic mouse, uh, I did find a nice progressive decrease in the visual acuity. That started around this time and became very apparent. That was the D3 variant. That was the D3 variant of the the that was the that was the that the one was the highest overage. Right? No, this was the two, TG two, so called TG two. We use the TG two variant in all our research, and that's what I'm going to call later as a transgenic animal. Thank you. So when I looked further into this uh, transgenic mouse, I found something weird though. Uh, I checked the ERG, and what I've seen that the, that the rod-driven scotopic ERG 
was going down really fast, already at 1.4 months, definitely at two months. It was going down very fast. All the while, the photopic ERG did not decrease at all in the first four months. Now, this is just one stimulus intensity in one mouse. I did a couple of mice uh, and a couple of different stimulus intensities. And I plotted here the B-wave amplitudes. This is the photopic. This is the photopic B-wave amplitudes. They increase as you increase uh, uh, the stimulus intensity. Now, what I would like you to see on this is that compared to this control, uh, to the control values, we have a decrease uh, of the scotopic B-waves amplitudes already at 1.4 month, and then this follows uh, a progressive decrease. Whereas in the photopic B-wave, which shows us what's happening with the cold system, uh, nothing bad is happening in the first four months, seemingly, and then it suddenly drops at seven months. So why is this weird? It's weird because server three, the TG, the transgenic mass model, is supposed to be a cone rod dystrophy model. So if the cones were dying first, I would this would have to be reversed. We would have to see this picture here and this picture here. Now this this was weird and it was showing a definitely a rod cone dystrophy more reminiscent of retinitis pigmentosa, but at an early age. So I did the uh, optometry measurements, the visual acuity measurements in darkness to assess the rod function, the rod acuity. Now that showed the same thing that I found with the ERGs, that the rod system started, started to, uh, was already uh, subnormal, uh, already at one month to start with and the visual behavior was gone at four months. This visual behavior that is driven by the rod system. So the core system started to go down sharply only after the rod, rod system was totally knocked out. So this definitely looks like a rod cone dystrophy. Now, we've done a couple of, uh, a whole string of measurements together with the Bernstein lab, where I, who are you, uh, at that time, measured VLC PUFA levels in the retinas. So, because I was talking about VRGs and optometry, but we haven't talked about anything about what's happening with the lipids in these mice. Now, I have measured and found that we, the total VLC PUFA content at one month, uh, this shows, is shown by the magenta line, at one month, the VLC PUFA content was already down by 75%. And this decreased further here. Uh, this is still the transgenic mouse. Um, now, this contains all the information that was up here before, plus the living information, so it's a little hard to digest, I, I'm guessing. But if you can look at only this, what's happening at around three to four months, that's when, that's when a mouse is considered early adult. Uh, at this point, this mouse model shows about 5% of the VLC plus remaining. Uh, these rod driven uh, visual acuity is not measurable at this time already, whereas the cone driven visual acuity is slightly increased okay, at that point. So, what does uh, that tell us? Um, it tells us that. At this level, at around 5% of VLC PUFAs in the retina, the cone function was mostly retained and rod function seemed to have been lost. That would, have, but that would say that rods seem to be, at least mouse rods, seem to be more sensitive to VLC PUFA loss than cones. Maybe. Now, is that really the case? Um, to figure that out, we really had to take out ELOVL4. Now we cannot do that in the whole mouse, but we can do that, and we did that, by creating our own new mouse models, where we took out ELOVL4 specifically in rods, or specifically in cones, cones using the pre velox genetic system. I'll tell about you this, if there will be time. Um, 
basically what we do here is that we take out both of the copies in rods, whereas we do not touch the copies in cones and anywhere else. So these mice are perfectly fine in terms of barrier function and all that. Then we uh, characterize these mice, look at the rod condition knockout, and uh, compare it to the normal mouse where you see yellow at 4 is present in the photoreceptor cell layer. And in the photoreceptor cell layer of the knockout mouse, you can see still some uh, columns of uh, rods that still show ELBL4 presence. We estimated that the knockdown was about 60-65% uh, efficient. And uh, when Aihua University lab measured the Asikufa content of these mice, she also found that the uh, approximately the same 65% loss of VLC-UFAS from these retinas. So this was not bad. So we tested these mice and checked whether the anatomy changed, and we found no sign of degeneration. We measured, we counted the number of cell rows in the ONL, and there was no difference between the controls and the knockouts. Uh, overall, the retinas uh, retina integrity looked fine. We asked the Mark Lab, uh, uh, specifically Brian Jones, uh, to perform an uh, electromicroscopic analysis of the outer segments because that's where we were thinking ELVF4 and VLC PUFAs are especially required. But he found absolutely no uh, change in the outer structure uh, of broad outer segments. So we thought that. Maybe the problem that we do not see anything here is that we only knocked out the LVL4 to 65%. So what if the rest of the cells, the 35% of the cells, are resupplying the others through the RPE with VLC PUFAs? So the next step, what we did was made another, uh, a better conditional knockout for us. And this time, the knockout was looked to be perfect. All the rods seem to have been labeled. Uh, uh, with Cree that takes out the gene. And uh, I have determined that there was almost no VLC PUFA left in these retinas. Uh, the total VLC PUFA level of the retinas went down by 98%. Uh, so only 2% left, which could have been in the cones. Probably wasn't the cones. So we were really happy to see this. And uh, so I measured the visual acuity of these mice uh, in darkness. And what I found was no statistically significant difference between the new knockout and its controls. Same thing with the old conditional knockout. I, it wasn't a big uh, surprise. There was no difference there. And uh, also, we didn't see an effect on acuity in the cone conditional knockouts in darkness. We did that was three to four months, but what happens at six or seven months? Very good question. I do not know yet. Uh, sorry, I actually know that. Uh, I do not know what's happening at 10 months. Six, seven, still nothing. Still. Yeah. Um, same thing with the uh, cone system. The, uh, the photopic visual uh, behavior was not different in any of the three knockout strains. Uh, then I measured some ERGs as well in uh, darkness. Uh, there's this, uh, the broad system and the photopic ERGs. And the, uh, the B-wave amplitudes were not different when I compared the congenic control to a knockout, the congenic control to a composition knockout, and congenic control to new broad knockout, uh, irrespective of what, what level of the uh, visual stimulus was. So to summarize, we've seen that 98% loss of VLC PUFAs did not cause any problems in young mice. Uh, at a similar level, at 95% decrease of VLC PUFAs, uh, we saw a huge reduction in the rod uh, capacity uh, or in the rod system in the in the transgenic mice. So that tells us that, at least in the transgenic mice, it is not the loss of PLC PUFAs that caused uh, the degeneration of the rods. 
Uh, yeah, that's basically would be that. So that would tell us that at least in the TG mouse, it's probably the UPR, the other uh, theory is more prevalent. Now, we think it's probably not the UPR because the UPR, the unfolded protein response, uh, requires certain key elements to be expressed at a higher level. Uh, and these elements here, uh, we've tested with RT-PCR and we did not see a significant increase in any of them. Now we would have to see at least a bit increase and or a chop increase to believe that there is a UPR, uh, an unfolded protein response going on in these mice. But it probably isn't. We checked it whether ourselves, whether it was really a good at rt -PCR by checking the GFAP, which is a <coughs> uh, or gliosis signal, and it was up uh, a lot. And uh, that's simply because uh, GFAP is expressed in your glial cells, glial cells in response to the generation, <coughs> and that happens inside, uh, in the transgenic uh, mice. So, um, are VLC PUFAs required? Well, we can be sure that they're not required for many months uh, at their normal level. 98% loss is still fine uh, for many months. And that means they are not immediately required for fluoresceptor cell function. Uh, that is not to say that in the long term it might not be needed. Um, and that also means, on the other side, that maybe 2% was perfectly enough to sustain function. Who is to say it's not? Uh, if that's the case, then, we all, then a, supplement, a supplementation study could be helpful because we might only need to increase the VLC PUFA levels just a little bit to save the cells, if that was the real case. Um, I've shown you also that the current models are actually not cone rod dystrophies with an early onset in mice. So at, th at this point, we do not have a model in our hand. We are working on some but not at this moment. Uh, and that's what we are doing. We are trying to create 100% retinal knockdowns. And we, do that, we are trying to do that, uh, accomplish that in two different ways. One is to knock out ELVL4 in both cones and, cones and rods. And that should take it out whole. Uh, and the other way that we are trying is to create a retinal knockout where we change the rods into a cone-like cell. In NRL knockout mice, uh, they do not develop rods. They are only cone, these, these, these have only cone-only retinas. Uh, and through a cone conditional knockout plus NRL knockout mixing, we will, in theory, get 100% knockdown in an all-cone retina. That should be the perfect uh, model the problem with that is that it degenerates on its own. So we'll have to see whether it degenerates faster or not than normal uh, with in, uh, without VLC PUFAs. And we are also starting to conduct feeding studies together with the Bernstein lab, uh, where we are going to try to bump up the uh, EPA uh, level of the, in the retinas. And that's a substrate for the remaining uh, ELVL4 function to work with. Thank you very much for your If you overexpress human gene, uh, then, then you definitely get a substantial functional loss in regards to the mouse model. But if you knock out 90% of a very long chain, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids. Yes. You don't seem to get much of anything. So could there be some secondary effect that's not just knocking out the very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid occurring with that overexpression mm -hmm. that we haven't figured out yet? What what are the levels what are the levels of the very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids in the you know in the Zang and the Zang model? Mm -hmm. Uh, how, how, how suppressed, how low are those as vision starts dropping at six months? Oh, uh, I can tell you that. I well measured it. 
There you go. No, no, there you go. So that's the Zeng model. This is the TG2. So VLC, so it's that yeah, right it's there. Yeah, it's starting lower than normal already. And then it goes down and down and down more. But you're still showing, you're still, to me, like even, even here, even at four months, you're, you're more than 2%. Yeah, it's about. So something else something. is going on besides just knocking down your very long chain of polyunsaturated fatty acid. But they would be getting the same results at four months. Mm -hmm. that you would be getting just knocking down the uh, that's exactly photosubstance. That's exactly So there's another, there's another effect. There's a secondary thing happening uh, beyond just knocking down VLC proof. Right. Yeah. Uh, definitely. Well, if. What that's, I, that's the system you got to figure out. The funny thing that is that well, the, uh, one has to be very cautious with mouse models, uh, as with any other models. Uh, well, I was going to point out, I see their alternative, just, the mouse is just playing not a species that's going to be able to show this clearly. <laughs> it is possible. We might and end up, we might end up dumping model. the mouse as well. I know primate model. models are a whole other order of magnitude. Yeah. And this is $100,000 level, that would be right. millions or tens of millions. Yeah. Um, yeah, so whatever you express, it doesn't have to be Stargard 3 mutant. Uh, in, in rods. Uh, if you express it at a high enough level, the rods will degenerate. They will show this degeneration. So it could be an extra rhodopsin molecule, which is in the right place to be. But if you push the rods to express a protein that in addition to its own uh, proteins, <coughs> then there is a very good chance that the rods will die. Cones are much more resistant to that. And it is possible that actually what, that's what we are seeing here. Now, if that was the case, we would however, probably see an unfolded protein response also. We don't see that. Now, it is possible that we just didn't look enough for that unfolded protein response. I cannot say that, that uh, with 100%, uh, for 100% that there is no UPR, absolutely. We just think that there is no UPR at the moment uh, because we haven't seen any evidence to the contrary. But yeah, that's probably the case in the transgenic mouse. That's why it's not really a good model. There is probably a good reason why the Ken group did not try to express VT1, the, the Y-type human yellow VL4, at the same level as the transgenic, as, as the Stargard 3 causing mutant. And also, uh, there was something funny even in the when they expressed the Y-type. Uh, so this is the transgenic mouse that expresses the white type human yellow VR4 at a lower, much lower level than, than the transgenic uh, mutant that, that expresses the mutant uh, gene. And we saw a little decrease here. And it seemed to be progressive, but slow. And basically, you could get, depending on the level of uh, expression, uh, you could get an increasing uh, the worsening and well faster regeneration here. So yes, you're totally right about that other effect. That other effect is the presence of a, of an extra gene that's not supposed to be there, uh, and an extra load on the cells that they cannot handle. Uh, rods are in general are pushed to the limits of their ability to the, to uh, synthesize new proteins and lipids because they renew their own structure, about 10% you know, of their structure is renewed every day, so that they have to remake themselves in 10 days, uh, totally. And that means a lot of rhodopsin has to be produced all the time. And it's actually not a very easy molecule to make. Yeah, so that's why they are probably much more sensitive than cones. They, they, they have a little different half segment. So it sounds like it's still back at the drawing board with the perfect model. Yeah, well, we are trying now with the double knockouts and the NRL knockouts. There are some drawbacks with both of those again, but still. Um, yeah. Good yes? Okay, Dr. Bernstein. Very good job. I'm sorry, that was the first few minutes. Thank and you. The, the main thing, you know, the thing that I want, want to emphasize to some people, some of the, the questions are, you know, why not just give all these very long chain fatty acids to right. patients? And the bottom line is they're not 
they're not in our diet unless you eat retinas or brains or skin as, a, as your usual diet. So that doesn't that doesn't happen, and they're very hard to synthesize, at least in large enough even to feed to a mouse. Gene Anderson's been trying to do that, and so so complex <laughs> enough to are not in there. Right. So you can give them EPA as the precursor. That's right. a better precursor than DHA. And we know DHA is a, DHA is not fish oil. Good. So you really have to keep fish oil. Yeah, fish oil. And we know and we're preparing a manuscript now where we're looking at autopsy eyes and looking at their blood levels, their their levels in their fat, and and their and what's going on in the retina. You can clearly see that the, that the that there's a correlation to the EPA and DHA intake of the person before they die and what you see in the retina. Hmm. We even had the one extreme of a patient who was just a huge outlier. He had like five to ten times as much. He um, go to very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids in his retina. We asked, well, what is what was different about him? And it turned out he had been on two feedings. He was a debilitated person, but they were giving him 10 grams, I think, of fish oil per day, which is just huge. Yeah, huge amount. I mean, they, when we give uh, A-Reds patients when they're supplementing, it's one gram. I mean, it, so it threw everything off, but you can see it translate all the way into the retina in this bit. It's very easy to pick that out. The question is, in these mouse models, you have a defective yellow wheel for it. Can you bypass that? But in Normal and people like us, you know, have a normal ELOBL4, there is a big influence on the diet as to what's going on in your retina. And we have some evidence that in with aging and with AMD, those levels drop a lot. So there is something going on, even if you're not seeing the changes in yeah. the diet. But did didn't you have a study though that was with a group of starters mm -hmm. that by supplementing them with uh, uh, complex omega-3 fatty acids? Did have a statistics that have been So yeah, that's what you're getting into is I have, and I don't know if Peter showed this in the beginning or not, but I have a cohort of eight, a family of 18, 18 people here in, the, in Utah and California that have uh, the ELOBL4 defects. In this. And one of the things we found initially with this family is that some people had bad disease and some didn't. And they were all over the place. So we could correlate that actually with, with, their, fish, with their fish intake. If they ate fish. Mm -hmm. They were they were relatively protected, and an awful lot of people absolutely hated fish, and they were going they were essentially going blind. Yeah. And so I have an open label study now, still going on, where they're I'm at least encouraging them to take fish oil, and we're following them by ERG, and we're just about it's now been about four or five years since so we can actually start analyzing what's been going have on. Have you got any preliminary on that? They, they think they're seeing better, but you know there there's some preliminary small small effects that we're seeing. It's a relatively benign um, intervention to tell people to go to Costco and get fish oil. But some of them still won't do it, so I actually have, have a controlled study with this. Some of them have been very non compliant. Interesting. So, is it enough that you would recommend at this point in time clinically? That, that, uh, is it a benign yes. treatment? You, yeah. you are recommending that they take. Yeah. How much are you recommending that they take? About a gram a day. Yeah, a day. A dish regular fish oil. oil. Fish oil, again. There is some difference, this translates into the AREDS study. AREDS is also using fish oil, which I think is the right, they made the right choice by having EPA and DHA. There have been other studies that are using these mice and other, where they gave only DHA, pure DHA, which you get from algae. And with that, they had a lot of failures. And that made, this, the explanation may be that you're not seeing the, the you're not really giving them a better precursor. Have you got any preliminary on the uh, A-Reds too? Is there any? I mean, is, is uh, it open or Even if I knew, I could not tell you. The it's one of these if you talk it. You, yeah, you know. so A-Reds 2 is closed. The, the results will be announced in May or June. I pro I invited to be on the writing committee, so I don't know in February. I absolutely cannot tell you. Okay. <laughs> I don't know anything now. <laughs> well, there's, there's a lot of people down there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of writing on yeah. that so. Very good. Yes, there is one more question there. Can I just ask a really quick question? Yeah. And I apologize if you addressed it during the course of your talk. But initially, you talked about the pathology, the agrosomes, the human mutant clones. And I think that was the first thing that the lab type one. And did you look at that in your mouse models? Because that could play into the mechanism for cone loss. You know, it could activate a pathway like the unfolded protein that we are ubiquitin or some 
copy, just the agrosome itself. So that could be the reason why using one copy of the protein didn't actually have a functional effect because you weren't generating agrosomes. So did your mutants generate those agrosomes? So um, in knockouts, you cannot expect to see any agrosomes because there is no yellow VL4 in them at all. Now, in transgenic mice, you should see agrosomes, but interestingly, nobody has ever looked at it. Um, we haven't seen them. The only evidence for agrosomes and the whole basis of this field is uh, all of it is based on cell studies, on cell culture studies. And that's, again, another interesting thing there. And that could be why you're 